one of the maybe most controversial aspects of the Word of God, the Bible, are the supernatural things in the Word of God, the supernatural things in the Bible, the miracles that we see, uh, all the powerful miracles that Jesus, Jesus per performed. And I'm wondering if, if you believe in miracles, if you believe in the spiritual, spiritual realm, if you believe uh, that these things can happen today. And to be honest with you, I do. I genuinely uh, do. I've experienced some miracles uh, in my own life. For example, when I was praying about uh, going to seminary and going into full-time ministry, I asked God for a very specific sign. And God gave me uh, that sign. And another uh, uh, miracle that I witnessed just from last year was when we went on the mission trip to Korea. Uh, we were praying, I was praying anyway, that God would give us good weather for the mission trip because, as you may know, in Korea during the summertime, it rains a lot. It's very hot, it's very muggy, and it rains a lot. But on this mission trip, we were there for like 10 days, and really it only rained one day, and it was only a sprinkle. And the day that it rained was during a travel day when we were going from Naju, uh, Naju to Yangsan. Now, you may think that these kinds of things are maybe just completely uh, a matter of coincidence, but uh, we have all heard, maybe I hope that you have heard, some accounts, some reports of miracles that are not so easy to write off, not so easy uh, to explain. I think I may have shared this one before. There was a professor from a school, a very well-respected Bible scholar, and he wrote this book uh, about uh, this, these uh, miracles that just can't be explained away. And there was this one story of a woman. She was on her deathbed. She was a young woman. And she was basically uh, uh, paralyzed. She was completely paralyzed uh, because of multiple, multiple sclerosis, MS. And she claims that she heard the voice of Jesus to stand up, to rise and walk. And immediately when she heard that voice, she started to walk. And there, was, there wasn't even any atrophy in her, in her muscles. Now, you may think that that's just you know, uh, you know, a legend, a fairy tale. Just somebody made it up. But there were actually three doctors who were attending this woman, and they put it down in writing that that is exactly uh, what happened. They put their own reputation, they put their own careers uh, on the line uh, to bear witness that this actually uh, did happen. Of course, this woman, uh, she did uh, pass away uh, not too long ago, as a matter of fact. And that's the, that's the thing about miracles, right? I mean, no matter how many miracles that you may experience in your life, we still live in a broken and sinful world, right? We still live in a broken sim and a sinful world, a world where disease happens, a world where uh, demon possessions may happen even, a world where people still die, right? You know, when we read the accounts in the Bible, if, that, if those things happen today, the more miraculous things, like if Jesus raised people from the dead today, uh, we, know, we know that sooner or later they would still die again. Right? Because in the Bible, uh, they passed away again. So these miracles that we read about, the miracles that we hear about, especially the miracles of Jesus Christ, they're pretty amazing. They're really, really amazing. But what our scripture, what our text is telling us today is that it is the word of God that gives life. It is the word of God alone that gives us life. And that's what I'm going to be sharing and unpacking from this text uh, today. So in this section, uh, as I said, uh, Pastor Nathan uh, preached from verse 14 to 30 last week, but this whole entire section is basically a summary of uh, the Gospel of Luke, right? It's a summary of the Gospel of Luke. And in, and in this passage, uh, Luke gives us a summary of the ministry that Jesus did, the things that Jesus does, like we just sang about uh, earlier, earlier today. And in particular, it was focusing uh, ob obviously on uh, the miracles, the miraculous signs, the signs and wonders. And these miracles, they basically tell us uh, that the kingdom of God has broken into this world. The kingdom of God has broken into history. That the kingdom of God has, in fact, broken into our lives through the authority and the power of the word of God, who is Jesus Christ, the son of God. And uh, Jesus Christ, uh, if we read the Gospel of John, calls him the word of God uh, very pointedly. And uh, he is called the word of God because uh, he is the fulfillment of, of God's word. He is the embodiment, if you will, of God's word. And um, so he is the word who became flesh, uh, so to speak. And it is through faith, 
faith in the word of God, who is Jesus Christ, that we receive the gift of eternal life. But our eternal life is not something that we wait for when Jesus comes back. Eternal life is not something that we experience when the end of the world happens and then we go to heaven. No, our eternal life is meant to be experienced right here and right now through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, right here and right now. And so this passage today shows us three ways that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, impacts our lives here and now. And the first thing is this, is that the Word of God is from God. No duh, right? The Word of God is from God. But how often, brothers and sisters, do we take this truth for granted? How often do we take this truth for granted? And how seriously do we take this obvious truth that the word of God is from God, the maker of heaven and earth? So in our story today, Jesus went from his hometown of Nazareth, and he went to Capernaum, a city along the, the Sea of Galilee, and he, taught, and he taught people in the synagogue, as he normally does. And as he taught, verse 32 tells us that the people were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Authority. So first of all, what was Jesus teaching and preaching that had so much authority that it amazed the people? Well, verse 43, it tells us uh, what Jesus was teaching and preaching. He was teaching the good news of the kingdom of God. In other words, he was teaching and preaching the gospel, the gospel. And second of all, what was it about his teaching and preaching that caused the people to be so amazed that they recognized that it had authority, great authority? Well, it's because back then, when the Jewish teachers and preachers, when they taught from the scriptures, they would only teach and preach what other teachers and preachers were saying about that text. So they would say stuff like, Rabbi such and such said this about this text. Rabbi so and so said that about the text. That's how they would teach back then. And the reason that they taught in this way is because they would never presume to be the mouthpiece of God which totally makes sense, right? They would not presume to be uh, the mouthpiece of God directly. They would never presume to be a prophet of God. But Jesus, he didn't have such hang-ups. You hear me? Jesus, he had no qualms about teaching the scriptures as if his message about the good news of the kingdom of God were coming straight from the mouth of God himself. Because that's exactly what it was, coming straight from the mouth of God himself, who is Christ. And so all the people, they had never seen this before. They were amazed by the authority by which Jesus spoke, how he taught and how he preached. But it wasn't just that, was it? It wasn't just that. Jesus cast out demons. He healed the sick, and he did it with just his word. He'd say, get out, and then get out. And then to the sick, he would say, be healed. And they would be healed just with his word. The power, the power of his word proved that his word came from God. Proved it. And so when the people saw all that he was doing with his word, the amazing way that he taught, the amazing way that he preached, and then the power of his word to cast out demons and to heal the sick, they were like, whoa! We would be like that too, I hope. Whoa! <laughs> what words these are! With authority and power, he drives out, uh, gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. You know, one commentator he made this ob observation that in the church today, that the testimonies 
about the miracles of Jesus, they don't seem to have that much of an impact on us, especially those of us who live in first world nations like we do here, right? We've heard these stories and they're so familiar to us. And he pointed out two, two reasons why that, may be the, why that may be so. First of all, in first world nations, we tend to rationalize a lot. We rationalize things because of our modernist perspective. Science is king, right? So we rationalize based upon science. And not only that, we, we patronize. We patronize these societies that, that thought in this way and think in this way because we, th we think, oh, they don't know any better. That's just how they dealt with sickness. That's just how they uh, interpreted disease and, and things of that nature. Very rationalized or patronizing, as a matter of fact. And second of all, and this may be actually even worse, we are so used to hearing these stories, as I said, that we miss. We don't see we don't experience the spiritual realm that is all around us. And in that spiritual realm, brothers and sisters, there is a war raging. There is a war raging between God and the forces of evil, don't you know? This spiritual realm that is all around us is actually more real than the world that we see, feel, and touch, don't we know? Right? Don't we know? And so this commentator, he said this. He said, if the spirit world does not exist, then Jesus is merely a motivator or encourager. And these stories lack any substance. These are meaningless stories, just myths, like reading Greek mythology. If, if these miracles actually did not happen, if the spiritual realm does not exist. And in fact, the accounts would be lies since Luke presents Jesus as having authority over, over such forces. Authority. That's why Luke is telling us these things. That's why. He's not spiritualizing these things psychologically, emotionally, you know, like we do today. For Luke, these things were very, very real. Because here's the thing. If the words of Jesus have power and authority to drive out demons and to heal the sick, that means that the kingdom of God has indeed come in him, Jesus Christ. And not only that, that means that the age of the devil is over. The age of the devil is finished. And the church age has started. The age of the spirit is here. But that's only true if all these things really happened. Just as he recorded them. The word of God is from God himself. And not only that, the Word of God is for us. Word, the Word of God is for us. And the Word of God is for us. Why is that? Because God is for us, don't you know? <laughs> Praise God for that. And as the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, if God is for us, what did he say? That's right. Who can stand against us? Who can be against us? Thank God! That God is for us. God is for you. God is for me. God is for us. And again, the main point about all of this is, of course, that Jesus is the Christ. And in Christ, the kingdom of God has broken into this world. That's the main message here. The demons themselves knew this very thing. They knew who Jesus was. And they even shouted out, We know that you are the Son of God. Right? And when we read the stories, there's a series of miraculous events happening here. We might think, well, maybe Jesus just exercised demon, uh, a demon in the, in, the, in the synagogue on a Sabbath because he just wanted to prove that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God. And not only that, maybe he wanted to pick a fight with the, the Jewish authorities because that's what he did. He wanted to pick a fight with the Jewish authorities, and so he cast out a demon on the Sabbath in the synagogue because you're not supposed to do that. You know, according to Jewish tradition, that was a, that was a big, big no-no. So maybe we can be cynical and say, oh, he did this just to prove a point. But then we find Jesus in the home of the apostle Peter, and his mother-in-law is sick. And Peter says, hey, can you, can you help out my mother-in-law? She has a bad fever. She's really sick. She might die. She's old. Right? And so Jesus, he, he rebukes the fever. 
And the fever, it just departs from her right away, and she starts serving them uh, right away. And we might think, even in this story, well, you know, Peter was a good friend of Jesus. He was one of his most important apostles. And when Peter asked Jesus personally, hey, can you do this for me? How was Jesus going to refuse his friend? How was Jesus going to refuse uh, one of his most important apostles and disciples? Right? But then the sun goes down. Right? And what happens? All these people in Capernaum, which is not a small city, by the way, all these people in Capernaum who are sick, they bring the sick, they bring the demon possessed to him, and he starts healing every single one of them. He lays his hands upon them. He casts out the demons. And again, they're like, whoa, Jesus, we know who you are, right? And he casts them out and he heals the sick, every single one. He did not turn down a single one of, one of them. And, and the thing that stands out for me about this story that Jesus is healing, every single person that comes to him is this. He didn't spend the time to vet them, did he? He didn't spend the, the time to think, do you have the right theology? <laughs> do you believe in me? You know, If you believe in me, then I'll heal you. Did Jesus do that? No. He just healed them. Just healed them. Are you, are you, are you holy enough to be worthy of my healing? Wow. <laughs> Thank God Jesus doesn't ask us that, right? Are you holy enough to be worthy of my forgiveness? Whew. Thank God Jesus doesn't demand that from us, right? Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? No. He heals every single one. And not only that, he touches them, lays his hands on them, which was forbidden in Jewish culture too. You're not supposed to touch sick people because if you do, then you get sick. You become unclean. But he did that because of his great, great love for people, for everybody. His great compassion for them. His great, great compassion. He connected with our human weakness. He connected with our human struggle. And he expressed that by touching them touching us. And this is one of the reasons why if I ever have a bad day, have you ever had a bad day? <laughs> Brothers and sisters. <laughs> or maybe you've had a bad week. Has anyone ever had a bad week before? Maybe it's been a bad month. Maybe a bad six months. Maybe it's, a bit, maybe it's been a bad year. Right? But whenever I'm in that place where my heart just seems dark and dry and so far from God. I know, I know that I can always call on him and he will always answer me without exception. The blood of Jesus has never failed me yet. And I know, like we were singing today, it never will. It never has, and it never will. He's always there for us, brothers and sisters, always. And so while the main point of this is that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus reveals God's great, great love for every single one of us, his great compassion for us, by healing and cleansing everyone who came to him. Everyone. Because it's not just some abstract theological proposition. <laughs> the kingdom of God. You try saying that to somebody who's a non-believer. What does that mean? What the heck is that anyway? It's not just that the kingdom of God has broken into this world and broken into history. The first time I ever read that statement in a theology book, I was like, what the heck does that mean? I didn't know. It was so abstract. It's like, I don't know what that means. But the kingdom of God has broken into this world. The kingdom of God has broken into this history. What it means is that the kingdom of God has broken into your life. The kingdom of God has broken into my life in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what it means. And I don't know about you, but Jesus, 
And when I cry out in those moments, he has answered my prayers over and over and over again. When I've been sick, when I've been depressed, when I've been dejected, when I'm struggling with something, when I'm in a financial bind, Jesus has answered my prayers over and over and over again. And may I suggest to you, brothers and sisters, because, because of love, that if that's not your experience with Jesus Christ, maybe it's just because you're not praying to him. Maybe. Or maybe you are praying to him, but you're just kind of treating him like a genie in a bottle. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ is not a genie in a bottle. He is our Savior, and he is our King. That's who Jesus is. And I'm not suggesting that Jesus has answered every single one of my prayers. I don't think it works like that even, like that either. But even so, I trust, I trust, I trust that Jesus knows what's better for me than even myself. Jesus knows what's better. And not only that, not only that, even when Jesus doesn't answer my prayers, I will yet praise him because he is my God and my king. Is he your God and king, brothers and sisters? Amen. I hope you get, a, I get an amen out of that. Let's try that again. Is he your God and king, brothers and sisters? Amen. Oh, that's just too easy. <laughs> Yeah. Here's the bottom line. God's word is most definitely for us because God himself is for us. And God is happy. And he is pleased to heal us. And he is pleased to cleanse us. God is happy to give us whatever it is that we may need. But more than healing, more than exorcisms, more than health, or wealth, or prosperity. God desires that we have eternal life. Eternal life that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is all. He wants every single one of us to have eternal life. All of humanity. Every single one. But you know, this eternal life, as I keep saying, it's not something that we wait for. Why do we keep waiting for, for eternal life to come, why do we keep waiting for Jesus to come back? We get a taste of heaven here on earth through faith in Jesus Christ. We have a taste of eternal life in the here and now. And eternal life, it comes from the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. And what the Word of God gives to us is this most powerful thing in our lives. And that is hope. Hope is what we need. Hope of eternal life is what the word of God gives to us in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is our salvation. He is our reward. He is our protection. He is our shield. He is our cleansing. He is our healing. Jesus Christ, he is the word of God. The last point of... I want to share today is this. Is that the word of God is for everyone. As I've already hinted at. So the word of God is for everyone. And why is the word of God for everyone? Because the world needs Jesus and the world needs Jesus now. And I know this to the very depth of my heart and to the top of my lungs. <laughs> I need Jesus, and I need Jesus now. And so I know that you do too. That is my testimony, and I hope and I pray that that is your testimony as well. That is the testimony of the mission team that we are sending to Korea. That is the testimony of every mission team that we sent out, and I'm going to remind them today. Some of you are here, and I'm going to remind you again. And I'm going to remind you over and over and over again. The world needs Jesus, and the world needs Jesus now, because you need Jesus, and you need Jesus now. That's our testimony to the world. 
We're not better than anybody. We don't have any right to go over there and say, oh, Jesus is the Son of God. Believe in him and you'll be saved. No. It's, please. I need Jesus, and I know you do too. That's the testimony, brothers and sisters. That is the testimony of our lives. And if you don't realize that, if you don't realize how much you need Jesus in your life each and every day, each and every moment, you know what? That's a terrible place to be. <laughs> because if you don't realize how much you need Jesus, you're not going to seek him out. And if you're not going to seek out Jesus, where is he? Where are you? This is what leads to spiritual dryness. Guarantee it. When we become spiritual, spiritually dry, it's because we don't know how much we need Jesus. Because if we knew how much we needed Jesus, we'd go seek after him. And you know what? He would find us. Just because we're looking, he will find us. Right? That's how it works. You know, Jesus isn't playing hide and seek with us, brothers and sisters. Do you feel like Jesus is playing hide and seek with you? It's not like that. It's not like that. So anyway, in our story, the next day, Jesus, after a long day, I, you know, <laughs> he was in the synagogue, he was preaching, he was healing, casting out demons, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then all these people start coming, and I'm sure that it went late into the evening. Jesus was healing, 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 casting out demons, casting out demons, healing. We get the impression that that was going on for a long time. And then early the next morning, at the break of dawn, Jesus gets up and goes to a solitary, solitary place, as it says here. And to their credit, the people of Capernaum, when they realized that Jesus was not there, they must have gone there early in the morning too because they had more sick people. They had more people who were possessed by demons. They wanted to find Jesus. And to their credit, they knew that they needed Jesus. So they go looking for him. They go look for, looking for him. And they find him. Because when you look, go looking for Jesus, you'll always find Jesus. He'll find you, as a matter of fact. So it was a good thing that they knew that they needed Jesus. What was not so good is that they tried to hold on to him for themselves. Because it says here in verse 20, 42, they tried to keep him from leaving them because they wanted Jesus for themselves. But Jesus refused to stay. He refused. They were praying, Jesus, don't leave. He said, nope, got to go. <laughs> Sorry, got to go. He says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. He said, I must. I must, because that is why the Father sent him. It was to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to a world that desperately needs Jesus and desperately needs Jesus now. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That really is the mantra of the Christian life. That's our mission. That is our mission. Now there's a couple points here about this that are really important for us to understand. And the first one, I already talked about it a little bit. When Jesus was healing and cleansing all the people, they wanted to keep Jesus for themselves. But it's not that they wanted to keep Jesus for themselves. What they wanted was his power. If it was somebody else, if he could have transferred his power to somebody else, they would have wanted, wanted it from that other person. They wanted Jesus' healing power to heal the sick, to cast out demons. That's what they, they wanted. But here's the thing. No matter how many people Jesus healed, they would probably get sick again. You know, and no matter how many people, you know, Jesus cast out demons from, people do get repossessed sometimes. It happens. It does happen. And not only that, we know the other stories of Jesus' most 
crazy miracles of when he raised people from, from death to life. And we know that those people, they died also, like Lazarus. Jesus raised them from the grave. Lazarus died eventually uh, again. And so the point about that is this. We don't need miracles to prevent us from dying, brothers and sisters. What we need is the word of God so that we may have life and life to the full. What we need is the word of God so that we can experience eternal life. And I understand that that's all very kind of abstract and theological. It's like, what does that mean? Tell me what that means, Pastor saying. I don't know. I just live it out every single day of my life. And it's really hard to explain. I'd have to be here all day talking about these things, which is why maybe the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching to the Ephesians, he was there for like all day preaching. There's so many things, so many things. The Word of God gives us eternal life, and the Word of God gives us eternal life for the here and now. And Jesus called that the fullness of life or abundant life. That is the life that God wants you and me to have, the abundance of life. That comes from the word of God when we conform our lives to this book who is Jesus Christ. Right? The second point is this. Jesus, he had to go. He had to go to fulfill the mission that God the Father had given to him. But here's a question. What was preventing any of those people from going with him? Right? What was preventing them from going with him? If they wanted him to stay so badly, why did they not just go (laughs) with him? Right? Because that's what the Great Commission is all about, right? That's what the Great Commission promises to us, as a matter of fact. (laughs) It tells us, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we are so desperate to have Jesus with us, then we need to go with him where he goes and do what he does. And I'm not here suggesting that Anybody here needs to give up their career or their future career or whatever the case might be and give their lives over to Jesus Christ and serve him as a pastor or a missionary or anything like that. That's not what I'm suggesting, but you know what? Why not? (laughs) Why not? I mean, do we do we think that God cares us, cares for us so little that he would not provide for us? and that he would not reward us richly for serving him and his kingdom. But that's not the point that I'm making here. That's not the point that I'm making here. Here's what I'm saying. We call ourselves the body of Christ. And the only way that we can call ourselves the body of Christ is if we are on mission with him to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to a world that desperately needs Jesus and desperately needs Jesus now to the, to the ends of the earth. That's how we call ourselves the body of Christ. You know, churches, church life is, is wonderful. <laughs> it's beautiful. A lot of joy there, right? Amen? Amen. The fellowship of the saints fellowship of the Holy Spirit, communion of the Holy Spirit. Oh my gosh, good stuff, right? If you've tasted it, if you've seen it, oh man, good stuff. But let me tell you something. Sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes it's hard. But I'll tell you something else. The only reason that this church, GCC, is doing so well 1,000% guaranteed it's only because we are on mission with Jesus Christ. Only reason. 
Nothing else. Because you know what? Just look to your left and to your right. We're all imperfect people. We're all sinners, are we not? This church is really no different from any other church as far as people are concerned. Right? You get me? But what we have is the mission that God has given to us. And simply because we are on mission with Jesus Christ to proclaim the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth, that's the only reason that we're so shiny and bright and growing and all that stuff. But it's not about our size, is it? It's not about any of that stuff. It's not about this building. God forgive me. Sometimes I complain that our space is too small. But, you know, God forgive me. But it's not about that. It's about the mission that God has given to us, right? It's about the mission, brothers and sisters. And so let me close today with just a reminder and an exhortation for you all, right? First of all, the reminder, as Carlton already reminded us, we have a mission team going to South Korea, the southern regions of South Korea, right? And our mission team is basically set. Not everyone could be here right now, so we can't introduce everybody to you yet, but in due time, we will introduce the mission team to this community so that we can, so that we can pray together for this mission trip. But let me just uh, ask three things. First, just please pray for the team. You don't know who they are yet, or mostly, but you will eventually. But just pray for the team. Pray that the Holy Spirit would unite us with one heart and one mind right? in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ and the mission that he has called us to do in South Korea. Pray that we would be united as one team, one heart, one mind, one spirit, and the Holy Spirit. The second thing is this. As I'd like to remind you guys on these mission trips, the team that goes out, we are a representative of this body. So we are you, and you are us, right? Even if you can't go, you are there through us, and you are there in us. So what I want to ask is when we start our fundraising, that you give generously to the mission team, because it's not cheap going to Korea. I mean, airline tickets themselves is just really, really expensive. So when we start our fundraising, please, please give generously so that we can all be in this together as one body of Christ. And the last thing I will want, the last thing I just want to say is this. Even though we haven't introduced the mission team yet, not everybody, you may know some people that are on the mission team, and you will come to know them more and more, who they are. Please encourage them greatly. Encourage them deeply. Pour out your love on them. Commend them for their sacrifice so that we may go with joy and thanksgiving representing this body. Amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.